Chapter Three of Jill the Reckless by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Jill and the Unknown Escape. One. In these days, when the authorities who watch over the welfare of the community have taken the trouble to reiterate encouragingly in printed notices that a full house can be emptied in three minutes, and that all an audience has to do in an emergency is to walk, not run, to the nearest exit, fire in the theatre has lost a good deal of its old-time terror. Yet it would be paltering with the truth to say that the audience which had assembled to witness the opening performance of the new play at the Leicester was entirely at its ease. The asbestos curtain was already on its way down, which should have been reassuring. But then asbestos curtains never looked the part. To the lay eye they seem just the sort of thing that will blaze quickest. Moreover, it had not yet occurred to the man at the switchboard to turn up the house lights, and the darkness was disconcerting. Portions of the house were taking the thing better than other portions. Up in the gallery a vast activity was going on. The clatter of feet almost drowned the shouting. A moment before it would have seemed incredible that anything could have made the occupants of the gallery animated, but the instinct of self-preservation had put new life into them. The stalls had not yet entirely lost their self-control. Alarm was in the air, but for the moment they hung on the razor edge between panic and dignity. Panic urged them to do something sudden and energetic. Dignity counseled them to wait. They, like the occupants of the gallery, greatly desired to be outside, but it was bad form to rush and jostle. The men were assisting the women in their cloaks, assuring them the while that it was all right and that they must not be frightened. But another curl of smoke had crept out just before the asbestos curtain completed its descent, and their words lacked the ring of conviction. The movement toward the exits had not yet become a stampede, but already those with seats nearest the stage had begun to feel that the more fortunate individuals near the doors were infernally slow in removing themselves. Suddenly, as if by mutual inspiration, the composure of the stalls began to slip. Looking from above, one could have seen a sort of shudder run through the crowd. It was the effect of every member of that crowd starting to move a little more quickly. A hand grasped Jill's arm. It was a comforting hand, the hand of a man who had not lost his head. A pleasant voice backed up its message of reassurance. "'It's no good getting into that mob. You might get hurt. There's no danger. The play isn't going on.' Jill was shaken, but she had the fighting spirit and hated to show that she was shaken. Panic was knocking at the door of her soul, but dignity refused to be dislodged. "'All the same,' she said, smiling a difficult smile. "'It would be nice to get out, wouldn't it?' "'I was just going to suggest something of that sort,' said the man beside her. "'The same thought occurred to me. We can stroll out quite comfortably by our own private route. Come along.' Jill looked over her shoulder. Derek and Lady Underhill were merged into the mass of refugees. She could not see them. For an instant a little spasm of pique stung her at the thought that Derek had deserted her. She groped her way after her companion, and presently they came by way of a lower box to the iron pass-door leading to the stage. As it happened, smoke blew through, and the smell of burning was formidable. Jill recoiled involuntarily. "'It's all right,' said her companion. "'It smells worse than it really is. And, anyway, this is the quickest way out.' They passed through onto the stage, and found themselves in a world of noise and confusion compared with which the auditorium which they had left had been a peaceful place. Smoke was everywhere. A stagehand carrying a bucket lurched past them, bellowing. From somewhere out of sight on the other side of the stage there came a sound of chopping. Jill's companion moved quickly to the switchboard, groped, found a handle, and turned it. In the narrow space between the corner of the proscenium and the edge of the asbestos curtain, lights flashed up, and simultaneously there came a sudden diminution of the noise from the body of the house. The stalls, snatched from the intimidating spell of the darkness and able to see each other's faces, discovered that they had been behaving indecorously, and checked their struggling, a little ashamed of themselves. 
The relief would be only momentary, but while it lasted it postponed panic. "'Go straight across the stage,' Jill heard her companion say. "'Out along the passage and turn to the right, and you'll be at the stage door. I think, as there seems to be no one else around to do it, I'd better go out and say a few soothing words to the customers. Otherwise they'll be biting holes in each other.' He squeezed through the narrow opening in front of the curtain. "'Ladies and gentlemen!' Jill remained where she was, leaning with one hand against the switchboard. She made no attempt to follow the directions he had given her. She was aware of a sense of comradeship, of being with this man in this adventure. If he stayed, she must stay. To go now through the safety of the stage door would be abominable desertion. She listened and found that she could hear plainly in spite of the noise. The smoke was worse than ever and hurt her eyes, so that the figures of the theatre firemen hurrying to and fro seemed like brocken spectres. She slipped a corner of her cloak across her mouth and was able to breathe more easily. "'Ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that there is absolutely no danger. I am a stranger to you, so there is no reason why you should take my word, but fortunately I can give you solid proof. If there were any danger, I wouldn't be here.' All that has happened is that the warmth of your reception of the play has set a piece of scenery alight. A crimson-faced stagehand, carrying an axe and blackened hands, roared in Jill's ear. "'Op it!' shouted the stagehand. He cast his axe down with a clatter. "'Can't you see the place is afire?' "'But, but I'm waiting for—' Jill pointed to where her ally was still addressing an audience that seemed reluctant to stop and listen to him. The stagehand squinted out round the edge of the curtain. "'If he's a friend of yours, miss, kindly get him to cheese it and get a move on. We're clearing out. There's nothing we can do. It's got too much of an old. In about another two ticks the roof's going to drop on us.' Jill's friend came squeezing back through the opening. "'Hello. Still here?' He blinked approvingly at her through the smoke. "'You're a little soldier. Well, Augustus, what's on your mind?' The simple question seemed to take the stagehand aback. "'What's on my mind? I'll tell you what's on my blinkin' mind.' don't tell me let me guess i've got it the place is on fire the stagehand expectorated disgustedly flippancy at such a moment offended his sensibilities we're hopping it he said great minds think alike we are hopping it too you'd better and damn quick and as you suggest damn quick you think of everything jill followed him across the stage her heart was beating violently there was not only smoke now but heat Across the stage little scarlet flames were shooting, and something large and hard, unseen through the smoke, fell with a crash. The air was heavy with the smell of burning paint. "'Where's Sir Chester Portwood?' inquired her companion of the stagehand, who hurried beside them. "'Opt it!' replied the other briefly, and coughed raspingly as he swallowed smoke. "'Strange,' said the man in Jill's ear, as he pulled her along. "'This way. Stick to me. Strange how the drama anticipates life.' At the end of Act Two, there was a scene where Sir Chester had to creep somberly out into the night, and now he's gone and done it. Ah! They had stumbled through a doorway and were out in a narrow passage where the air, though tainted, was comparatively fresh. Jill drew a deep breath. Her companion turned to the stage hand and felt in his pocket. Here, a coin changed hands. Go and get a drink. You need it after all this. Thank you, sir don't mention it you've saved our lives suppose you hadn't come up and told us and we had never noticed there was a fire he turned to jill here's the stage door shall we creep somberly out into the night the guardian of the stage door was standing in the entrance of his little hutch plainly perplexed he was a slow thinker and a man whose life was ruled by routine and the events of the evening had left him uncertain how to act what's all this about a fire he demanded jill's friend stopped a fire he looked at jill did you hear anything about a fire they all come bustin past here yellin there's a fire persisted the doorman by george now i come to think of it you're perfectly right there is a fire if you wait here a little longer you'll get it in the small of the back take the advice of an old friend who means you well and vanish in the inspired words of the lad we've just parted from op it the stage doorman turned this over in his mind for a space but i'm supposed to stay ere till eleven thirty and lock up he said that's what i'm supposed to do stay ere till eleven thirty and lock up and it ain't but ten forty five now i see the difficulty said jill's companion thoughtfully well casabianca i'm afraid i don't see how to help you 
it's a matter for your own conscience i don't want to lure you from the burning deck but on the other hand if you stick on here you'll most certainly be fired on both sides but tell me you spoke about locking something up at eleven thirty what are you supposed to lock up why the theatre then that's all right by eleven thirty there won't be a theatre if i were you i should leave quietly and unostentatiously now to-morrow if you wish it and if they've cooled off sufficiently you can come and sit on the ruins good night two outside the air was cold and crisp jill drew her warm cloak closer round the corner there was noise and shouting fire engines had arrived jill's companion lit a cigarette do you wish to stop and see the conflagration he asked jill shivered she was more shaken than she had realized i've seen all the conflagration i want same here well it's been an exciting evening started slow i admit but warmed up later what i seem to need at the moment is a restorative stroll along the embankment do you know sir chester portwood didn't like the title of my play he said tried by fire was too melodramatic well he can't say now it wasn't appropriate they made their way toward the river avoiding the street which was blocked by the crowds and the fire engines as they crossed the strand the man looked back a red glow was in the sky a great blaze he said what you might call in fact what the papers will call a holocaust quite a treat for the populace do you think they will be able to put it out not a chance it's got too much of a hold it's a pity you hadn't that garden hose of yours with you isn't it jill stopped wide-eyed garden hose don't you remember the garden hose i do i can feel that clammy feeling of the water trickling down my back now memory always a laggard by the wayside that redeems itself by an eleventh hour rush raced back to jill the embankment turned to a sunlit garden and the january night to a july day she stared at him he was looking at her with a whimsical smile it was a smile which pleasant to-day had seemed mocking and hostile on that afternoon years ago she had always felt then that he was laughing at her and at the age of twelve she had resented laughter at her expense you surely can't be wally mason i was wondering when you would remember but the program called you something else john something that was a cunning disguise wally mason is the only genuine and official name and by jove i've just remembered yours it was mariner by the way he paused for an almost imperceptible instant is it still end of chapter three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com